What obvious thing did you just now notice? Story one. I was like 25 when I found out the jugs of washer fluid outside the gas station weren't free. I was walking out of the gas station with a buddy one day, grabbed a jug of washer fluid, and he asked me, did you just steal that? And I was like, no dude, it's free. It's not. I stole washer fluid for nearly 10 years of driving and no one ever said anything to me about it. Oh god, that reminds me of something similar for me. For several years, any time I was at my local mall, I would just pop into the Godiva shop for the free samples of chocolate-covered strawberries and go about my merry way. Eventually one day I walked in and they were under lock and key with a price tag next to them. I asked the shopkeeper when they started charging for them and she told me they never did it. I have a very similar story. I grew up in a small town and our local museum had town maps for free. As a kid I would grab a fresh map every few months and mark out new bike routes and stuff like that. Fast forward a couple of years, I'm 11 and visiting my aunt in the city. We make a quick stop for gas and head home. When we arrived at her place I bust out a Rand McNally. Aunt asks where I got that. I told her from the gas station. Confused, she says, but I didn't see you buy anything. I say, duh, it's a map. They're free. My aunt points to the price tag on the front and informs me they most certainly are not free. Story 2. How the American bail system works. I thought it was a sum of money you paid to avoid jail. I was surprised when I realized you get the money back if you show up for trial. The problem is, we have bail bonds. You are out on bail, but a bail bondsman pays your bail, and you don't get as much of what you put down. I am charged with a crime, I get a $10,000 bail. The bail bondsman lends me ten grand, with me putting down 1000 on deposit with him. Now, when I show up to the court, the bail bondsman gets his ten grand back, however I get nothing. It's a tax on poor people. I know this, but still don't understand why in every TV show or movie the person who gets bailed out by a random friend or family member always says that they can't pay them back, or will eventually pay them back, etc. But if the person goes to trial as they do 99% of the time, they get the money back regardless. So it doesn't make sense, because those friends aren't actually paying the court. They're paying a bail bondsman, the guys that send bounty hunters after you for skipping bail. In in short, most bail bondsmen will offer you something like this. Pay 10% of the bond and forfeit that money for good, and the bail bondsman will front the rest of the money to the court. In other words, they pay the court and you pay them. If you paid the court directly, you would get the money back, but most people don't have the cash around to pay that, or can't wait the months it takes to get the money back. Interest-free loan, if you will. So they go with a bail bondsman. Now technically, the bail bondsman doesn't actually hand over cash to the court. They give a bond, and the court only cashes the bond if you don't show up to the court, or jump bail. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and one of the jurisdictions I worked in had a shorthand when setting bonds. It was, for example, 25,000 CPS, which stood for cash, property, or surety. This means the third way to post the bond was a cashier's check in the full amount made to the sheriff's office, or have a lien placed against real estate with equity equal to at least the value of the bond, or go to a bondsman and pay them a 12.5% fee. As others have pointed out, as long as you attend all court appearances, with the first two ways, you'll end up getting all of your money back. Putting up property doesn't involve actual cash coming out of pocket, but it does significantly reduce the liquid value of the property. Paying a bondsman is paying for a service, and that money is gone. And a word about bounty hunters, they may dress like cops, they may talk like cops, they may be friendly with cops. They're not cops. You don't have to talk to them. They have no real arrest powers. They don't have have to read you your rights or respect any of your rights, though cops generally don't take many of your rights into consideration. Story 3. Not me, but my 21-year-old cousin just realized he's mildly allergic to peanut butter, and has been his whole life. Up until now, he had assumed everyone's throat closed up a little while eating a PB&J, and just fought through it. Stuff like this makes me think everyone has multiple food allergies and intolerances. We just wind up ignoring the minor irritations. Think our bodies just get constipation or diarrhea after eating at certain restaurants, or think we simply don't like the taste of the food. I've talked to people who vehemently believe nobody should drink milk because once they stopped eating dairy products, they stopped feeling sick all the time. They never seemed to think that they were probably lactose intolerant. We were at work and talking about how it seems that kids today have a lot more allergies than when we were growing up. One of the guys said that it came up one time with his grandmother in conversation and she said, we didn't have a lot of kids with allergies, but it sure seemed like a lot more kids choked to death back in my day. I do some immunology work and it's largely thought that the rise of allergies 
is due to a disrupted gut microbiome, less exposure to bacteria, viruses, parasites, from better hygiene, eating a high-fat, low-fiber diet, overuse of antibiotics, and moving towards an urban-slash-suburban lifestyle all severely shift the microbiota in your digestive system. All of the most common allergens, milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, wheat, fish, and shellfish, all have certain proteins that avoid degradation in the gut with our modern microbiome. This allows those proteins to slip into your bloodstream and mount an immune response, whereas they would typically just get broken down into nutrients and have no effect. People in developed nations have a completely different array of bacteria in their stomachs than those in developing nations, meaning that our bodies literally can't tolerate some foods that were common in the past. As nations get wealthier and cleaner, allergies will continue to rise. The traditional treatment is a fecal transplant, which is as unpleasant as it sounds, but there are some drugs in the testing phase that are trying to reintroduce the gut bacteria we're lacking. Story 4 Water towers are for water pressure, not just a town getting its name on a tank and saying, hey, look how much dang water we have. A fun way to think about it is like a siphon. It was explained to me this way. Look at the height of the water tower. That is approximately the height that the water can be pushed in that tower's catchment without additional equipment. It's kind of like putting all the water treatment and distribution equipment on top of a small mountain in the middle of the city with all the water flowing downhill from that point. Just had to explain this to my boyfriend the other day in the car. We were driving home and went by one and he said, you know, I have a hard time believing that the water for the whole town can fit in those things. It took me a minute to realize he was being serious. We both had a good chuckle after I explained that no, this is not where the water was stored. Story 5 that the best time to start saving for my future really was all those years ago, and the next best time is now. Anyone who saves and or invests has regrets. It's impossible not to. It's just part of dealing with money. If you had saved all of those years back, you would currently have a different set of financial regrets. It's kind of bad how it all plays out. People tell you to save when you're young, but when you're young, you don't know how to save. I always thought people just meant put it into a savings account in a bank where you make next to nothing on interest. At least teach some sort of financial literacy, like you could put 20% of your paycheck in the bank and keep the rest for spending. It's even better if you can directly deposit it. That way you won't even realize you're not getting your full amount. Then when you go to check your account, you will be shocked at how much money is in there. No one tells you these things or much else when you're young besides save for the future. Yep, it takes a lot more figuring out if you don't have a job with a 401k, and many people in their 20s don't. It didn't seem like a big deal not to have it all figured out yet in my early to mid-twenties. Professionally, it's fine to figure it out later, but you miss out on so much compound interest by not having those white-collar jobs. People think that they will open up an IRA when they have more to contribute, but there's a certain momentum to saving. Even if you can only put in 20 bucks a month to start, it's still worth opening today. Once it's open, and you have the connection to your bank, it becomes easy to add more. If you happen to have an excess of 100 bucks this month, maybe I'll throw it in the IRA. You get on a roll, and all of a sudden you have actual money money in there. Story 6 when I was a 20-something regular cannabis user struggling to clean my pipe, only then realized what the pipe cleaners were for. Those fuzzy, bendable tubes weren't just for childhood crafts. Yeah, I used to think they were like water pipes and never understood it. I guess elementary school teachers got really good at deflecting from that question. And for regular pot smokers, get pipe cleaners. They're fantastic, especially if you use a water pipe or the like with an actual pipe in it that gets clogged. Except buy real cotton pipe cleaners from a tobacco or head shop. The bright ones that they have in the craft section of Dollar Tree or Walmart and made of nylon fibers that A, don't absorb resin, and B, fall off the metal wire, getting stuck in the resin and making it much worse. Story 7. I recently realized that howdy is short for how do you do. I actually just googled it and it's technically short for how do ye. However, my realization still makes sense. Relatedly, I recently learned, probably from Reddit, that goodbye is a shortened form of God be with you, which people in ye olde England would say to each other when leaving. Relatedly, I only realized when I started playing D&D a few years ago that doff, as in doff your hat to a lady, is an old-fashioned word that is literally an abbreviation of do off, meaning to take off or remove. It's the opposite of don, as in I will don my finest suit. Story 8 
My grandson just figured out that I am his mother's mother. He just can't understand why I tell him we have to ask his mom to do some things. Why can't I just tell his mom we are going to do something? I am her mom and therefore her boss. That's so cute. Reminds me of when my younger niece realized that her half-sister, who does not live with her, was her sister too. Just like my older niece is her sister. She was amazed. She told me I saw daddy and Kay yesterday. We had so much fun. Did you know that Kay is my sister? My nephew still doesn't understand that his uncle is my brother, and his mom is my sister. He'll go back and forth on it constantly, but uncle is mom's brother. Yes, and just like how you have a sister, uncle and I also share a sister, your mom. Additionally, my niece used to gently grab my mom's arm anytime I called her mom, and would go, no, auntie, that's my grandma. Yes, I know, but she's still my mother. That's mommy's mom. She's my grandma, not yours. Honey, that is because she is my mother. Your mom and I share a mother. She is mommy's mom, not yours. Oh, you dear thing, that's not how it works. They're lucky they're cute. LOL. Editing to fix the confusion I accidentally caused. Three siblings in this situation. Me, my brother, and my sister. It's my sister's kids. Story 9. About a decade ago, I bought a Logitech Wave keyboard and mouse combo. Absolutely loved them and used them both until they wore completely out, which took a very long time. Used some other stuff for a while and very recently decided to replace them with another Wave set. They were exactly the same except for one small thing. The scroll wheel on the mouse worked differently. It spun freely rather than doing the soft ratcheting that I was used to. It wasn't a huge deal, in fact, scrolling through places like Reddit was much easier. Easier. I could just spin it and let it fly, but it sucked for things that required precision like swapping weapons and video games. I've just been putting up with it for like a month and just today I realized that the button below the scroll wheel isn't just a middle mouse button. It switched the scroll wheel from a soft click to free spin modes. I had no idea and it made my whole day. Oh man, this is such an amazing feeling. It's like a whole new world. One time I went to a friend's house and they had one of those curved sectional couches where the seats have recliners but the releases are in the seams. I popped one up in front of him and his family, and they all started staring with their mouths open. They thought they'd just inherited a really uncomfortable couch. Reminds me of that kind of feeling. I had a similar experience at work and ordered a new mouse because I thought since the mouse suddenly spun freely and I couldn't fix it, it was probably broken. So I ordered the exact same mouse again and it did the same stupid spinning. Of course, I said nothing because how would I not seem stupid? Well, I accidentally clicked the button a couple of weeks later, and to my amazement, the wheel worked. Now I feel really stupid, but I have two working mice. Story 10. Growing up, my grandparents religiously had a 3 p.m. Pepsi time, like tea time, I guess, but with Pepsi. Every time we were over there, it happened. We all enjoyed a crisp, fizzy, cold Pepsi. At 43 years old, I was telling that story this week when I suddenly realized theirs were most likely spiked. I'm older than you, and I only discovered day drinking during the pandemic, and then I figured out that way more people than I would have guessed have probably been day drinking or taking something during the day way before the pandemic. I've just been out here white-knuckling life every day. Don't get accustomed to it. It really is a slippery slope. I did not expect to go down. Better to raw dog. Alcohol is a lot of fun and mostly harmless until it isn't. Then it really isn't. Yep, I've been going through some crap the last couple of years. Went from a six-pack a week to now a six-pack a day or more, often starting before work. It's not fun anymore. It's just how I feel normal. I don't recommend it. Any youngins reading this comment get your crap together before you have to. It's a lot harder when you're in it than it is before you realize you're in it. To all you dads out there, don't give your kid beer when they're 12 because you can't relate to them. Grow up, figure your own crap out, and be a dad. Giving your kid alcohol doesn't help them grow up. It helps them screw up. My story isn't unique. It happens every day. It's generational. Let it stop with you. Story 11 that Bluey's parents' jobs are at the airport, drug sniffing, and an archaeologist digging up bones because they're dogs. There's a funny story in someone's Instagram short, don't recall the account name, it's a mom my wife follows who talks about gentle parenting. She's talking about how we often forget that little kids often incorrectly assume things or miss stuff that's obvious to us because they don't know better. The story goes that the parents told the kids they were going to Chili's for dinner as a treat. The kids get super excited all day looking forward to going to Chili's. That evening, they get there and the kids lose their minds in a tantrum because they had assumed going to Chili's meant going to have dinner at Bluey's house. Story 12. 
When getting an eye exam, you are asked which looks better, one or two. If they are identical or too close to call, you have a third option, the same. They never told me that. It took me years to realize that I could ask to compare them again and that it was okay to say either. I could not tell the difference, or that they were both bad but in different ways. It always felt like a test to see if I was lying about how bad my eyesight really was. Once a doctor explained that he wasn't trying to trick me and to take my time, he identified my astigmatism and I have seen significantly better ever since. Freaking eye exams tell you nothing about how they work. Optometrists must assume you've been blind forever and have always needed glasses. I keep getting my eyes checked, and they keep doing the flippy lens thing, and I'm thinking just use the eyeball scanner. He said, oh no, it's subjective. F off it is. My eyeball slash cornea is wonky and you can unwonk it. Optics isn't subjective. Story 13. I spend too much time choosing to be negative when I could really just be happy. After a vacation, I had a major attitude adjustment and applied to a school in the town I visited. Suddenly, debt doesn't depress me because I'm accumulating it for reasons I know are worth it. In the past few weeks, I've journaled mostly optimistic things, and today I realized I had spent over half of the journaling talking myself into a deeper hole. I can't unwrite it now, but that just makes me value the pages I have left so much more. I don't want my life to be a journal full of sad thoughts. I want to be happy. Today was an oddly good day at work, and all it took was some reinforcement from my boss and co-workers, which they gave me this because I've been trying to make all my interactions positive, making a little more effort to be relaxed and less worried. I've stopped thinking about being professional, and having that pretense will get me anywhere. So I'm dropping some of the uptight facade and just rolling with things. So I'm not solving every issue before it happens. So I ask the wrong people a question. So I forgot to follow up on something. So freaking what? Still getting stuff done for others. I'm too old to stress out the way I've always done. How do you get this to stick? Every time I try to be positive, it feels like life just decides to say, no, F you, and burns everything I own to the ground or floods my house or someone gets sick or injured, or any of a thousand other things that could go wrong. I can't just logic myself out of depression. I can't just decide to be happy and stay happy when I'm faced with living somewhere I hate for reasons mostly out of my control, having little money to survive and provide with, and having no real prospects to make anything better. I'm still depressed. At times, though, we have control over how much we let our thoughts feed into it. Find little things you're grateful for and that you look forward to. It will take a lot of time, but after about two weeks of actively trying to give myself good moments, I already see a difference. I can identify when I'm stewing on a negative thought with no real resolution and try to redirect the focus to something more optimistic. I truly appreciate your reaching out, but I would love to use your comment as an example. My journal is full of writing, just like it, almost verbatim in some areas. I spent hours of my life just convincing myself I would always be miserable, and surprise, that thought made me more miserable. It's like I was bullying myself. Imagine asking a crying child why they can't just be happy. Sometimes we kick ourselves when we're already down because we can't stop reliving or dreading moments we can't change. You're allowed to have bad days. We all need to figure out a way to take care of ourselves when we're not doing our best. But it starts with acknowledgement that we had a bad day. And that's okay. Not every day will be good. You don't see the good days coming until they happen. I don't know what will make you happy, but I know that whatever internal monologue every depressed person has played in your head for too often, and you need to develop a conscience about it. Allow yourself to move past it and make it stop. Depression brings on a whole mindset that works against your pursuit of happiness, but we have control over how we handle the negative thoughts it brings. Sometimes I think to myself, no thank you, and the thought ends there. With practice and belief in yourself, you will see results, but it takes time and a lot of Ted Lasso. TLDR, you're allowed to feel awful and even note it to yourself, but develop a recovery monologue to replace the my life is always going to be like this monologue. It takes time to stick, but it actively reduces negative thoughts after enough practice. I wish you the very best of luck. Story 14 that if I put my phone in a bright yellow case, I'll spend significantly less time wandering around my apartment muttering where the F did I put my phone? There is another option. I have Samsung and it's always connected to my Samsung Fit 2 watch slash band, and I have a Samsung tag, gift, for buying my old phone, and both devices can find my phone in the house. Maybe look into that as well. Surely there are options for iPhone and Android phones. Ugh, I'm constantly losing all my stuff. My girlfriend got me this tile thing for 
wallet and keys. My phone is black, so I lose my phone and then immediately everything else. So the tile has been useless. Most times, my stuff is always where I left it. It's just that she constantly moves it to a better spot. I just got a new phone and got a bright red case for specifically that reason. My couch, countertops, and desk are all roughly the same color as my phone and my previous case, and I lost it in plain sight every day. Now I see that pop of color and find it instantly. Story 15 that when a cat comes running up to me when I'm out for a walk, they are seeing me with the same excitement and novelty as I'm seeing them. That realization really made my day. My cat gets so happy when people walking by pay attention to him. I'm tempted to put a little picket sign out that says, my name is Bob, I love attention. Please say hi. You should. I don't know any of the neighborhood cat's names, but my husband and I have descriptive nicknames for them all. We'd be happy to call them by their given names. We did this for our annoying husky who barks at people because she's friendly. Once people started saying her name, she wouldn't bark anymore. There's a sweet old man that walks by every day at the same time, and she has to be outside to get her pet, or she will freak out and howl. My husband and I do the same. We ask their people for their names when we see them, but I realized I've been asking a ton of neighbors about their cat's names without bothering to ask the human names, or get to know anything about them other than cat things. Longfellow is a cat with a very long body. Skidmark is a Siamese cat with the unfortunate brown spot under his butthole. Cleopatric is the cat that looks like our cat, Cleopatric only fatter. Morningstar is the cat that looks exactly like our cat, DJ Beef. Morningstar because they make imitation beef. Story 16. The turn your head part of the turn your head and cough is so that you don't cough on the doctor. Was probably mid-30s before I figured that out. Always assumed it flecked something somewhere that helped him check whatever he was checking for. A type of hernia is called an inguinal hernia, a hernia of the groin. Coughing or other forms of strain puts pressure on the bulge that is the hernia and makes it easier to feel. If you have a hernia and didn't know it, you'll definitely know it after this test. It causes a really weird and uncomfortable twinge in your nuts. I imagine some time ago, when they started doing this procedure, a couple of doctors were probably sitting around at a lunch table and one doctor turned to another, not eating. Hey Bill, why aren't you eating today's diet or something? Nah man, just not feeling too good today. Kinda sick to my stomach with all the guys coughing in my face. What guys? Well I've been doing hernia checks all morning and the guys cough in your face. You don't tell them to turn their head first? Story 17 the line in the Bee Gees song is, And you come to me on a summer breeze, and not on a submarine. I don't know this song, but I do this with pretty much every song. At this point, I have given up trying to hide it, and I confidently sing along with my own lyrics. There's a song by the starting line where I sing, You should have known that this boy was a spoon. I'm 100% sure those lyrics aren't right, but at this point, I'm just singing what I sing when I sing along with the song. For a long time, I thought Bon Jovi was singing, We've got to hold on to what we've got doesn't make a difference if you're naked or not we've got each other and that's a lot whoa we're halfway there whoa living on a prayer take my hand we'll be naked i swear on the subject of mishearing old song lyrics whenever i heard can't fight this feeling by ario speedwagon it sounded like they were singing a corn dog in the night i kept thinking that can't be right why would they be singing about corn dogs finally looked up the lyrics the line is actually a cold dark winter's night I still can't not hear corn dogs at night, though. Story 18. Driving through South Dakota with my family, and I was so amazed by the vast fields of livestock. I turned to my husband and asked him how long it must take for the farmer to round up all the cows each night and get them into the barns. My husband laughed so hard. Apparently cows don't sleep in barns at night. Did you know the round hay bales are actually illegal? It's because the cows can't get a square meal. Some cows do, depends on the type of milking parlor or whether or not they're beaver dairy cows. In the warmer months, free stall milking cows sleep out in the pasture. In the winter, they sleep in barns where it's warm. When outside, the farmer still has to rustle them all up inside, but the majority of cows usually line up themselves and fight to get inside anyway, so there isn't really that much of a problem herding them in. Tie stalls are inside all year round unless they're dry, maternity leave for a few months, then they're outside or in their own separate barn and are not milked. Beef cattle are usually outside year round because they're thicker, have shaggier coats, and hardier than dairy cattle. They are often given the choice to sleep inside or outside and can come and go as they please. Story 19 
that there is no cheese in Chinese restaurant menus, as in the Chinese don't eat cheese. Discovered this a month ago. Whoa. Because the majority of people in the world are lactose intolerant as adults. Those of us who drink or eat milk products are all descendants of someone from Northern Europe who had a mutation allowing them to digest lactose even after being weaned off of breast milk. Mongolians also tend to have it. They were historically very dairy oriented. Any people who primarily were nomadic herders. And cheese often doesn't have lactose, or enough to bother most lactose intolerant people. Story 20. Those worms don't come onto the sidewalks when it rains because the wet concrete is irresistible to their squishy bodies. It's because they're drowning in the grass. This was a few years ago, but at that time I had a master's degree and was walking into my full-time engineering job. A bunch of worms were on the sidewalk outside of my building and an oh light bulb that clicked on in my head. When there's no sidewalk, worms will crawl up onto logs and climb plants to get out of flooding soil. It's neat to watch for if you ever find yourself walking in the woods in the rain. Gonna have to blow your mind again, that may not be the reason after all. It's only one of the three leading theories on why they come out in the rain. Another is that the vibration from the rain is similar to the vibrations that signal there's a mole in the area. Moles can dig way faster than you think, and they can eat a lot of worms very quickly. The last theory is that worms can travel faster above ground, but they don't usually try because of the risk of drying out. Like they come up in the rain so they can run around without about dying a crispy death. Story 21. I thought baby fever was an infection. Also, baby fever is definitely a real thing. I had a friend help me babysit my toddler sister. She's very child-free, feminist, too many people on earth type. Anyway, my sister, who was normally on a little psychopath, wasn't feeling good and just wanted to be held. She crawled into my friend's lap and just rested her head against her chest. It was so cute. After that, she was like, I'm still not sure if I want a baby, but I know I want that baby. She actually started becoming my sister's regular babysitter, would offer to watch her for free sometimes all weekend. I very rationally know I don't want, can't handle, and won't be able to have a baby for many reasons, but something in me just gets activated when I'm around babies that makes me feel the need to care for them. My stepmom said that she had to wear those absorbent pads in her bra for a long time after giving birth to each of my step-siblings. A random baby crying in a store would automatically get the milk overflowing again. Some maternal instincts are so interesting. Story 22. Cows only produce milk because they are mothers. I mean, I genuinely thought cows just made milk all the time until not that long ago. They have to have babies and have a nine-month pregnancy just like humans then we take their milk from their babies. They're forcibly impregnated so that they will give birth and produce milk. If the baby is a boy, he's either killed immediately or raised for a few weeks to become veal. If it's a girl, she's raised to be another milk machine. Either way, the baby is taken away and the mother is extremely distraught every time. This process has happened multiple times in her life. When the cow stops producing milk or is too physically exhausted from constantly being pregnant, giving birth, and being milked, she's then killed to make cheap hamburger meat, usually at around 5 years of age. The natural lifespan is about 20. How in the hell does this have so many upvotes? The US produces almost no veal, because veal isn't just baby cows. Veal requires holding the calf nearly immobile and force feeding it for months without letting it walk or move, which violates animal cruelty laws in most if not all of the US. Cows are often artificially inseminated, yes especially on large commercial farms. Would you rather be inseminated by a little tiny straw or a thousand pound bull? But the male calves are castrated and raised for beef. The female cows are raised to maturity and turned into dairy cows. And no farmers take the calf from their mother in the first few weeks. That's stupid. It's way cheaper and easier to let a mama cow raise the calf for the first few weeks. Then you take the calf and bottle feed it because mama will produce less and less milk as the calf starts eating grass and will then go into to estrus again. Old dairy cows are made into dog food, not hamburgers. Come on people, all you have to do is listen to the damned farm report to know calves aren't stripped from their mothers immediately. They list the prices for cows with calves on, along with the prices for heifers and steers on the damned radio every morning. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you'd like to share with us, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. 
For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time.